Halloween is my favorite holiday. I get to dress however I want without anyone judging me and party it up with people just as excited about the holiday as I am. What's not to love? There's this one Halloween party I go to every year at a friend's place. The party starts the moment the sun sets on Halloween and doesn't stop until well into the following morning. This particular year was no different. I got dressed up in my trusty black cape and red waistcoat to match with my girlfriend's black dress and red corset. We helped each other make sure that our fangs were nice and shiny. We got to show them off once a year, so we wanted to make sure they were pearly white as we scared the trick-or-treating kids with them. It was well after sunset by the time my girlfriend and I arrived at the party. There we saw some of the same familiar faces we'd been seeing since forever. Ghouls and goblins and all matters of creatures that went bump at the night were all gathered there to have a good time, chatting amongst themselves and helping themselves to snacks and refreshments arranged by the very gracious werewolf host. There was one face I didn't recognize, though. A disheveled young man stood in a lonely corner of the party watching everyone else enjoying the party with burning contempt in his eyes. His costume, if you could even call it that, was just a white t-shirt with some blood stains on it and a black trench coat that made him look like a Matrix reject. As much as I loved talking to my old friends, the stranger had me curious. Rarely did we ever get new faces at our little annual celebration. If they weren't invited, they were trespassing on private property. And something about the young man's clear disdain for everyone there made me think the latter was far more likely. While my girlfriend caught up with some witches and fairies, I approached the stranger to make some small talk. Hey there, I said with a smile. How are you enjoying the party? It sucks, he replied in an instant, just like everything else in this shithole of a world. Hey, there's no shame in sucking. I flashed him a smile that showed off my pristine white fangs that I made sure looked extra sharp for the occasion. The young man didn't laugh at my joke. He just grunted and turned his gaze towards some sexy demon girls dancing to Boris Karloff's Monster Mash. Look at those sluts, he said, showing off their bodies like bitches in heat, just to be a tease to men they know they'd never date. Whores like them deserve to rot in hell for never giving average men who aren't goddamn models like you a chance. It was at that moment that I realized I was talking to, as the kids call them these days, an incel, more commonly known as a total prick. You don't really mince words now, do you? Why should I? The young man's gaze shifted back to me. Why should I care about hurting their feelings when women like them never cared about mine? Women are all the same. They use nice guys like me only to cuck us for chads who won the genetic lottery, like you. You do realize you sound like a complete wanker right now, yes? It doesn't matter. Nothing will matter soon enough. A police car passed by the house, its blaring siren, briefly lighting the window beside us with red and blue lights. It was accompanied by the sound of a panicked police making an announcement through his car's mounted megaphone. Citizens be warned. An active shooter has passed through this area. Stay indoors and lock your doors until the shooter has been apprehended. The warning echoed over and over all throughout the street. For the first time since I met him, the young man smiled. I abruptly realized that he had his hands in his trench coat the entire time we were talking. You're starting to realize who I am now, aren't you? At that moment, my girlfriend finished catching up with her friends and came back to me. The young man's eyes widened in impotent anger upon seeing my girlfriend approach. Being as beautiful as she was with that form-fitting corset on, she looked exactly like the kind of woman the young man hated for their reluctance to sleep with him. Hey, love, who's your new... Before my girlfriend could finish her sentence, the young man pulled a revolver out of his trench coat and shot her. The bullet hit her right on the forehead, and she was knocked backwards onto the ground by the impact. The young man let out a cackling laugh. <laughs> You're all so fucking dead. He cried to everyone at the party who had stopped what they were doing to look at him. I'm going to murder all you fuckers and the world will finally know what happens to pieces of shit like you who look down on people like me. He let out another lengthy evil laugh that grated on the ears. He only stopped when he realized someone else was laughing alongside him. <laughs> oh man, you're right. 
said my girlfriend as she picked herself up from the ground. She had a tiny skin-deep scratch on her forehead where he'd shot her, which quickly healed as if it were never there. The fuck? The young man turned the revolver towards me instead and let loose the five remaining bullets into my chest. I felt bullets slam against my chest and a bit of break skin, but it was nowhere near strong enough to knock me down. Really, mate? I said, half joking and half genuinely upset. This has been my favorite shirt for like a century and you just had to ruin it. The entire party erupted in laughter. It's good to know that there will always be people out there with a sense of humor. Huh. How did you? Before the man could finish his question, I calmly grabbed the wrist of his gun hand and squeezed it. His bones snapped like dried twigs within my grip and his revolver clattered onto the floor. He screamed in pain with tears in his eyes until I let go of him. He stumbled backwards and leaned against the wall to support himself as he cradled his shattered wrist. You'd have better luck killing me with a 2B pencil mate, I told him. He looked up at me and I could only see fear in his teary eyes with all the bravado caused by his homicidal hatred gone from his face. You're really not that bright, are you? I almost pitied the poor fool at that point. Key word, being almost. You brought a bloody six-shooter to kill a house full of people. What were you gonna do afterwards? Pistol whip us all to death? People in the party laughed. It felt nice to have a good crowd. Moreover, I gestured to the rest of the party guests, filled with werewolves and devils and things that go bump in the night. Don't you think these costumes are a little too realistic? I've seen a lot in my time, but that look of dawning comprehension on his horrified face is a memory that'll bring a smile to my face for centuries to come. He tried to make a run for it, but the moment his back left the wall, I slapped him across the face with the back of my hand. His entire jaw came off at the hit, and he crumpled to his knees crying and gargling on his own delicious blood. I sometimes forget how fragile humans are. He attempted to scramble towards the door on his knees and one good hand, only for the werewolf host to bring his clawed foot down on his ankle, completely destroying it. I think he tried to beg for his life. Or maybe he was crying for help. It was hard to tell what he was trying to say without a jaw. We all ate well that Halloween night. Hey guys, I see many of you commenting on my videos that this channel deserves 1 million subscribers. But I also see the percent of people who watch my videos aren't actually subscribed to the channel. So, if you like the content, want to support my channel, and want to see this channel reach 1 million subscribers, or maybe 500,000 subscribers, then go ahead, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. It's free, and you can always change your mind later. I became a mom pretty early on in life. I was 24 when I had my son Ryan, and by 26, I had my daughter Jessica. My marriage didn't work out, so I became a single mom as I loved my kids with all my heart. As my kids grew up, I noticed that they particularly had a fondness for the Halloween holiday. Their faces lit up every single time the 31st of October was approaching, and I could see their excitement as I made their costumes. Every year, I threw a Halloween party at our house. I would invite the whole neighborhood to come with their children, and after the first successful party, it soon became a wonderful tradition. Well, it was, till the arrival of our new neighbor, Angus Duncan. Now, Mr. Angus was a peculiar man, as the only thing you could describe him as was an old soul, or he preferred to live in the past. For example, while others used lawnmowers to cut their lawns, Mr. Angus preferred to manually cut his by using a cutlass. And when you tried to call him, he'd tell you to write him using a letter. I remember asking him, why don't you like using the new methods, Mr. Angus? They are much more easier. I remember him looking directly at me and replying, the original is always better. At the time, I didn't know what this truly meant so I remember laughing it off and saying, well, you can't argue with that. Until today, I deeply regret those words. The month of October was quickly approaching and I had begun to set up the annual Halloween party I had always hosted. I remember sending out all the invites the day before through email and that's when I remembered about our new neighbor, Mr. Angus. While Mr. Angus didn't have any kids, I thought it'd be rude not to invite him over. Due to his peculiar behavior, he didn't have much friends, so I decided to invite him to the party. 
I didn't have time to write a letter, so I just walked up to his house and asked him if he wanted to come. I remember saying, Sorry to disturb you, Mr. Angus, but I normally throw a neighborhood Halloween party. Would you be interested in coming? I remember he looked irritated at the sound of the word Halloween, and he said, Halloween? Don't you mean Samhain? Confused, I replied, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean. And that's when he said, Samhain, summer's end. You, you know what? Never mind. You people don't know how to truly celebrate it anyway. My confusion continued to rise, but I just replied with, Oh, I'm sorry, it's just something I do for the kids, and I thought you'd be interested. His ears picked up at the sound of kids, and that's when he said, Kids? The children are going to be there? I was still confused as to why he was now interested, as he knew kids were coming, but I brushed it off and said, Yeah, it's actually really for them. And that's when he looked at me and said, I'll be there to show you how to truly celebrate Halloween. And with that, he shut the door. As I walked back home, my mind was still a little phased at what an odd man he was. But I thought to myself, there's nothing wrong with him. He's just a little different and there's nothing wrong with that. But come tomorrow, I'd realize how truly different Mr. Angus was. <laughs> the party started out great as usual. The children were having fun playing around in their costumes and their parents were chatting away with themselves. Angus arrived in the middle of the party and he came with a box full of candy that I had never seen before. They weren't wrapped in a wrapper, so I assumed that was odd. I walked up to him and said, Welcome, Mr. Angus. I was beginning to think you weren't coming. As I spoke, I noticed he wasn't paying attention to me. Instead, he was intensely staring at all the playing children. I began to sense a bit of dread, but I brushed it off as one of his odd behaviors. I then asked him, Is that candy? And he said, Yes, handmade candy for my homeland. I then said, that's great. I'll just take that from you and place it on the table. And that's when he said, no, no, I'll give it to the children myself. And with that, he walked away. A feeling told me something wasn't right, but as I was about to follow him, one of the kids broke a lamp, so I became distracted. After a while, I cleaned up the lamp and I was about to go look for him. That's when Mr. Angus appeared, and at the top of his lungs, he said, Come here, kids. I have magical candy for all of you from my hometown. What he said got all the kids' attention, even my children. And that's when they all began to rush him and take the candy he was sharing. They all put candy in their mouths, and by their smiles, I can tell it was really good. In about three minutes, the candy was gone, as all the kids had finally taken and finished the candy. I began to think to myself about how it was a great idea to invite Mr. Angus. But in under two minutes, I regretted that decision as the most horrifying scene began to play out before my eyes. The children began to act erratic as they began to gasp for breath. And within seconds, they all began to convulse and fall to the floor. Instinctively, I ran towards my kids, Ryan and Jessica, and I began to hold them. I was confused and scared and I began to scream, somebody get help parents were carrying their children and bolting to the door, but all the doors were locked. The chaos began to increase tenfold, and amidst all of it, we heard Mr. Angus scream, Witness Samhain! Silence filled the room as we all stared at him, and that's when he began to pace the room. Speaking, he said, Be gladdened, for their sacrifice will protect us from the Dark Ones. This is the way it has been, and this is the way it should be. The veil is thin, and their journey should be quick. We should all remember death is inevitable. Their sacrifice will be appreciated, and they will be reborn. While he was speaking, upon hearing the words dying and sacrifice, I noticed my kids weren't moving, and I looked around the room to see the same, as the look of pain and confusion was on the face of every single parent. Sobs began to fill the room, as every parent had also noticed what had happened. That's when Mr. Angus began to speak again. Don't cry. I did this. I did this for you, for us. I had to. They had to be sacrificed so you could always bear more children. As he said the words, I did this, the room became tense 
as the horrific realization dawned on us. The homemade candy. It didn't take long before the men rushed towards Mr. Angus, and they began to subdue him. The doors were broken down, and numerous calls were made. Within minutes, the police and the paramedics were flooding through the house. Deep down, I knew it was already pointless, as I held the cold corpse of my two kids in my arms. The following weeks were filled with numerous investigations and questions. I was called to give a statement, and I told the policemen everything that I knew. By the time the investigation was finished, we were given reports and we were told that Mr. Angus was a man with Celtic roots and he was one of the few people who still practiced Celtic paganism. One of the cops said, Samhain was the origin of Halloween. Old Celtics believed that on the 31st of October, the veil between our world and the world of the dead becomes thin. According to research, they also believed that evil and troubled spirits could also come over. So to stop that, they performed animal sacrifices in order to appease these spirits. Mr. Angus himself confirmed this as his motive, and he knew he had to perform a sacrifice. But unlike the Celtics, he knew he didn't have time to gather animals, so his twisted mind decided to use the children as a sacrifice, which is why high traces of cyanide were found in the corpses of all 34 children, as the candy he made was laced with them. Mr. Angus was given life imprisonment, but even then, I felt like the justice system failed me, as I knew filth like him deserved to die. I buried my seven-year-old son, Ryan, and my five-year-old daughter, Jessica. Even after five years, there is no stopping the pain. It also stings every time I heard someone say, the original is always better. Every night before Halloween, an uncanny feeling rushes down my spine. I grew up in a town in Alabama with my little sister, Kathy, and my dad. Our mom died when we were too young to understand what death is. Since then, dad raised us with utmost love and care. My sister was a quiet kid and I was the talkative one. She had difficulties in making friends because of her quiet nature, so I always took her with me whenever I played with my friends. I loved her and felt the need to be there for her all the time. From a very young age, I realized that she could have used some motherly affection from me. She used to dress up in front of the mirror and ask me and dad how she looked. No matter how funny she looked, we always replied with a smile. You look like a beautiful young lady. Our compliment ended up putting a smile on her face and joy in our hearts. We went to the same school, so all my friends and kids from our neighborhood knew my sister. Some of them picked on me, saying my sister is weird and she only tags along because no one wants to be the friend of a weirdo. I remember punching Benny when he said this in front of Kathy. Kathy cried a lot that night, and for the first time she said, I want mom. My dad loved my mom more than anyone in this world, and her untimely death affected him to such an extent that he refused to remarry ever again. My aunt tried a lot to fix him for a date with her friend, but my dad refused right away. I knew he had another reason to refuse to get married, and that was his children. He thought, no stepmom will ever love us like her own. My dad has sacrificed a lot just to give me and my sister a happy life. Being kids, we generally took part in every community event and everyone in town loved us. It was the month of Halloween and I was excited to go out trick-or-treating with my friends. I was six and Kathy was four years old at the time. Kathy was nervous because it was her first Halloween. We decorated our porch with carved pumpkin heads. Dad bought us all the things we put our hands on for Halloween. My best friend Jim and I were sipping on lemonade, sitting on our porch and watching the entire locality buckling up to celebrate Halloween. Kids were running everywhere and people were laughing and decorating the town. Suddenly, I heard Kathy talking to someone. Her room window is right beside where we were sitting. Dad went to get some groceries and I was the man of the house at that point. So, I was pretty aware that Kathy is alone in her room. Then who is she talking to? I got up and went to her window. Who are you talking to? I peeked in and saw Kathy was sitting on her bed, holding her teddy bear and staring at the closed door. Her pace turned fail as I caught her off guard. She nodded her head, saying, No one? Why are you standing outside my window? I smiled and said, Dad is going to the market. Jim and I are sitting on the porch. Call me if you need anything. She smiled back, and I came back. The same night, we were having dinner. Dad was cooking steak for us. I was sitting at the dining table and talking to him about our Halloween costume when we heard Kathy humming a tune. I have never heard this tune before, so it felt a bit unusual. She was sitting on the porch braiding her Barbie doll and humming this tune like we weren't even there. 
I looked at Dad and got surprised. His face was white like a blank sheet. He stopped cooking and asked Kathy, Where did you... Who taught you this tune? Kathy looked at us and said, What tune? The tune you were just humming. Dad replied, I wasn't humming any tune. Her aloof behavior made me confused. I looked at Dad and said, Why, Dad? What is it about that tune? Dad got back to his cooking saying, Nothing. Let's eat. We finished our dinner and went to bed. It was around midnight when I woke up hearing a chuckle from Kathy's room. She was laughing, and I haven't heard her laughing in a long time. I got up and walked to her room to tell her to go to bed. As I opened her bedroom door, I saw her lampshade falling on the floor creating a loud thud. In that fraction of a second, I didn't fail to notice how the lampshade was levitating in the air, and Kathy laughed seeing that. What was that? What do you mean? How was it on the air? No, it wasn't. Standing in her room, I felt extremely cold. Kathy lied down and closed her eyes, ignoring me completely. The next morning, when I told Dad about this, I saw him get worried. But the joy of Halloween distracted us from that one important matter that we shouldn't have overlooked. As the kids came out in the neighborhood, dressed up in their Halloween costumes, they were knocking from house to house with their buckets to collect as much candy as possible. Their cheerful voices echoed in the town as they cried in joy, Trick or treat! I wore my favorite Batman costume and Kathy dressed up as Superman. We came out and met my friends, Jim and Mike, on our way to the sugar hunt. After covering almost every house in our neighborhood, Jim said to go a bit far to find some more houses. Even though, Dad told me not to go too far with Kathy. But that one night, I did act like my age. We walked on the empty sidewalks, keeping our locality behind us. There was not much residence nearby, and the deep woods starts onwards too. On that dark Halloween night, I could see Kathy getting scared. She said we should go back, but I assured her nothing will happen. After walking for some minutes more, we came in front of an old house. The house looked completely abandoned, but there was a big pumpkin head placed on the porch. A candle was burning inside it. Let's go to that house, Jim said. Mike and I thought for a second, but then we all started walking towards the house. I turned back and saw Kathy wasn't following us. She was just standing behind with a freaked out face. I asked her, what is it? She said, we shouldn't be going there. We should go back. I told her to wait near the stairs while we walked to the porch and knocked on the door. We knocked, but no one answered. Mike kicked on the door out of frustration and it creaked open. The dark hallway stood in front of us. A smell of old house choked my nostrils as the door opened. Anyone home? I asked. A long pause went by and no one replied. We all turned around to leave just when a woman spoke from the darkness of the hallway. Come on in. I was about to take the first step when Kathy rushed to me and grabbed my hand saying, Don't! It's her! She wants to hurt you! Who are you talking about? Blue-faced mommy! What? Three of us almost shit our pants hearing this from Kathy. Mike didn't even wait. He turned around and ran away. Jim followed him too. I stood in front of the dark house porch with Kathy. Suddenly, the woman inside spoke again. Kathy, bring him in. This time, her voice sounded rough and pissed off. <laughs> Kathy screamed, saying, bring You're not my mommy. Bring him in. Bring him in. Bring him in. <laughs> when we reached home, she busted into tears holding my dad. She said in a sobbing voice, I lied to you. Blue-faced mommy taught me that tune. I don't like her anymore, daddy. She wants you and Henry dead. I could see the fear in my dad's face. He uttered in a fumbling voice. Uh, how, how does she look like? Her face is blue and her eyes have no eyelids. She scares me. I don't want her to visit me at night anymore. That night, we all slept in Kathy's room. I remembered my dad shouting in the middle of the night. We don't need you. Leave me and my family in peace. That Halloween was the last time Kathy talked about blue-faced mommy. I don't know if she was real and I don't even want to know. But whoever in that house told me to come in surely had bad intentions. Bring him in.